So, Mr. Inglesias, you have said publicly that you received two, phone call two calls from members of Congress in October of 2006 about pending public corruption investigations. Who made those calls? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, honorable members of the Senate, thank you for the opportunity for me to set the record straight. And Senator Schumer, thank you for pronouncing my name correctly the first time. <laughs> the first call was made on or about October the 16th. I was here in Washington, D.C. on DOJ business. We were here for several days on subcommittee work, and I had uh, just returned to my hotel, and I received a call from Heather Wilson, United States Representative from New Mexico, District 1. The call was uh, quite brief. Now, Senator, shall I go into the contents, or shall I just give you the name of the individual to call? Yeah, I'll, I'll go through the questions and then get, give you a chance to fill in the details. Okay. Okay. So, who was the second call from? The second call was approximately two weeks later when I received the call at home from Senator Pete Domenici. Okay. And do you remember the date and the day of the call, day of the week? Uh, it was approximately the 26th or 27th of October. Right. And did someone place the call for the senator, or did he call you directly? Initially, his chief of staff, Steve Bell, called and indicated that the senator wanted to speak with me. Okay. And approximately how long was that phone call in total? Very brief, one to two minutes at the tops. Okay. At the time, were there public reports about a corruption investigation involving Democrats in New Mexico? Yes, sir. Please describe for the committee now, as best you can, your entire recollection of that communication. Please tell us what Senator Domenici said and what you said. Thank you, sir. I was uh, at home. This was the only time I'd ever received a call from any member of Congress while at home during my tenure as United States Attorney for New Mexico. Mr. Bell called me. I was in my bedroom. My wife was nearby, and uh, he indicated that uh, the uh, senator wanted to speak with me. He indicated that uh, there were some uh, complaints by some citizens. So I said, okay. And he says, uh, here's, here's, here's the senator. So he handed the phone over, and I... Uh, recognized the voice as being Senator Pete Domenici, and he wanted to uh, ask me about the corruption matters or the corruption cases that have been widely reported in the local media. I said, all right. And he said, are these going to be filed before November? And I said, I didn't think so. And to which he replied, I'm very sorry to hear that. And then the line went dead. So in other words, he hung up on you. That's how I took that. Yes, sir. And he didn't say goodbye or anything no, like sir. that. Now, did you take that as a sign of his unhappiness with your decision? I felt sick afterward. So I felt he was uh, upset that uh, at hearing the answer that he received. Right. And so is it fair to say that you felt pressured to hurry uh, subsequent cases and prosecutions as a result of the call? Yes, sir, I did. I felt uh, leaned on. I felt pressured uh, to uh, get these matters moving. Mm -hmm. And as you say, it was unusual for you to receive a call from a senator at home while you were the U.S. attorney. Unprecedented. It had never happened. Okay. How long after that contact with Senator Domenici were you fired? Approximately six weeks later, five, five, five weeks later. Thank about. you. Now let's go on to the call with Heather Wilson. Um, did the call with Congresswoman Wilson occur before or after your conversation with Senator Domenici? The call from Congresswoman Wilson was approximately two weeks prior to the call from Senator Domenici. You remember the day or date of that one? It was on or about the 16th of October. Got it. And please describe for the committee as best you can your entire recollection of that communication. Tell us what Congresswoman Wilson said and what you said. That was also a very brief conversation. She mentioned, uh, well, I mentioned I was just coming into Washington, D.C., and she joked, well, I'm sorry to hear that. I, uh, uh, she then asked me about, she'd been hearing about sealed indictments. And she says, what, what can you tell me about sealed indictments? The second she said any question about sealed indictments, red flags went up in my head because, as you know, we cannot talk about indictments until they're made public. In general, we specifically cannot talk about a sealed indictment. It's like calling up a, a scientist at Sandia Laboratories and, and asking them to, let's talk about those secret codes, those launch codes. So I was evasive and non-responsive to her questions. I said, well, 
we sometimes do sealed indictments uh, for national security cases. Sometimes uh, we have to do them for juvenile cases. And uh, she uh, was not happy with that answer. And then she said, well, uh, uh, I guess I'll have to take your word for it. And I said, I don't think I responded. Goodbye. And, that, and that, that was the substance of that conversation. Did you feel pressured during that call? Yes, sir, I did. Okay. Did you feel as sick as you did after the second call? Not as sick, because I didn't think there would be any more communications. Gotcha. Okay. Let me now go to, um, we have limited time. I want to come back to you, Mr. Iglesias, in the second round. Um, but I want to go now to Mr. McKay. Uh, our committee's interest in these matters are serious and, of course, any attempt to intimidate a witness into not testifying or not being cooperative would be very troubling. Let me ask this question. I'm going to ask this question of all of you, but I'm going to start with Mr. McKay. After your dismissal, did any of the, did any of you, um, first Mr. McKay, receive any communication from any official at the Department of Justice that you believed was designed to discourage you from testifying or making public comments? Senator, uh, a conversation was related to me by one of the panel members, Mr. Cummins, who I believe wants to address that first, if you would like to do that, and I'm prepared to comment on how I received that information. Fine. Mr. Cummings, why don't you then talk about that? Wants to might be a strong description of my... <laughs> <laughs> I'm willing to tell you truthfully about a phone call I received. Uh, about, I believe on February 20th, I received a phone call from uh, Mike Elston, who I believe is the chief of staff to the deputy attorney general. I had had some previous conversations with Mr. Elston. In fact, it was Mr. Elston that I contacted after the attorney general testified in this committee to express to him some concerns I had about the way I was being treated in light of the Attorney General's comments. And so <clears throat> I'd have to thank, we, we, in, over the course of this, Mike Elson and I have talked three or four times. Uh, that day was a Tuesday, as I recall, and there had been a Sunday Washington Post article in which uh, I was quoted uh, as saying, uh, something to the effect that the, the department can replace us for any reason or no reason, and also saying that if, if uh, they were somehow being deceptive or, or about the reasons about my colleagues because they didn't want to talk about the true agenda behind these other dismissals, that I thought that was unfair and that that should be corrected. And I'm paraphrasing. I don't have my exact quote. Mm -hmm. That was in a, a Dan Egan story in the Washington Post, I believe, on February 18th. Apparently, that struck a nerve that I had given that quote, and, and partly probably because they felt like they had done me right when the Deputy Attorney General had testified, and, and to that extent they certainly had, and he honestly said what my situation was and, and cut me out of this other category. And so maybe they felt like they'd been, been uh, somehow betrayed by me because I, I should still be in the fold. And so I, I, you know, I discussed that with Mike and told him that, that uh, number one, that the, pre, the paragraph right before my quote used, said that many prosecutors were enraged. And I said, that's not my, I didn't use the words enraged, that's the writer's words. Maybe some of the other colleagues are enraged, but that wasn't the context that I made that statement. I told him additionally that, uh, I pointed out to him that none of the U.S. attorneys had taken any action to stir up any controversy after we'd been dismissed. And it was only once Congress started calling the Department of Justice to task and they endeavored to defend their actions that any of us said anything because we weren't comfortable with what was being said. And then finally I pointed out to him that, that uh, all of us at that point had already received a number of phone calls from your staff and, and I, I'm not sure about the House at that point, but we had had many invitations already to come here and do this and testify, which we had all declined. So I was trying to remind him that we weren't driving this train, that, that it was really an issue between the administration and Congress, and we were just witnesses. And, and so, and this was all very congenial. There, this was not a tense phone call. Uh, but then at one point he did say that there was a, uh, uh, a feeling in the department 
that they had been too restrained in their defense of their actions, mainly concerning my colleagues. And this was after they had had the behind door session with the Senate to show whatever materials they showed. And he indicated that uh, that there was a viewpoint held among people and some people in management department that that uh, if if the controversy would continue to be stirred up, that that more information, more damaging information might be brought out. And I'm not attempting to quote him here, but the, mm -hmm. the, the inference was clear that that and it, I, and again, I think it mainly applied to my colleagues, not to me, because right. I had been separated.